Hello and welcome to Age of Darkness. Today we are going to be looking at the most efficient ways to push back that darkness in the stage of the start of the game to wave one for each faction. We're going to be looking at the build orders that will get you the most economy while providing the defenses you need to fight off Death Knight 1, which you can see on screen now. These builds will work for any difficulty up through Nightmare, and I plan to make a separate one for Harder Than Nightmare with custom modifiers. With my luck, it'll probably be relevant for all of five minutes, but if the updates do warrant changes to the build, I will put those in the comment that is pinned up like a fly. As always, I recommend that you experiment on your own because figuring these things out yourself is a big part of the fun of the game. But if you want the best start possible and build orders are not your thing, or if you do have your own build order and you just want to compare it to someone else's, here you go. Oh, and because the game is super buggy and crashes on me frequently, and the standard nightmare mode does not autosave in a way that helps with those crashes, this is being played on custom settings with nightmare density and horrific duration, which actually produces the exact exact same conditions as the nightmare mode, but with frequent autosaves and a couple of manual saves that will help very much in comparing these different build orders. And we'll begin with every noob's best friend, Order Eddie. So we will immediately place a house because we need workers, and ideally we want houses down in the first couple seconds of the gold cycle so that they will finish before the next cycle begins. Then we immediately start clearing out the nearest forest, set all units to target strongest, and split off one soldier to go scouting. Needless to say, if you are not using hotkeys, it's time to start. You always want to be thinking about what are we building next cycle. This time we are building nothing next cycle, but our first two buildings will be lumber camps. That is because wood is our first limiting factor as we have no income for it currently. We need to find good spots for those. And by good, I mean they need to combine to at least 36 wood income, meaning an average of 18 each. I choose that number because it's the least amount that you need to get a fast keep, and it is easily achievable in almost every map. That said, in some cases you may not start near enough wood, in those cases just restart. It'll only cost you a couple of minutes of time. It's almost time to place our first lumber camp, so we have brought our scout, who is also going to be our building spotter to the first good lumber camp spot, and while the army is on attack move, we will place our first camp. We should obviously go for the best spot here, but for the sake of demonstrating that you only need 36 wood income for this build, I am choosing the inferior 19 spot. That done, we will send our scout to the next lumber camp spot, and having found enough wood, we are now looking for stone. We need two stone veins that total 10 stone tiles each, or 20 stone income. That is because the keep upgrade requires 20 stone. And now that we have some wood income, gold becomes our limiting factor, and the keep is by and far away the most efficient way to boost our gold income. So we want it as soon as possible. We found one six tile vein already, so we only need to find a four plus from here. Next cycle, we'll be building a house for more workers, and there's some nice tucked away space here, so we will leave a pikeman to spot and build that house as soon as the gold ticks over. Looks like we found a little bit of iron already, which is incredible, but we are not ready to capitalize on that yet, so we're going to ignore it for now. Because the enemies get heavy this far out and we've already found a stone vein in this direction, we're going to circle the army back around to look in another direction, clearing along the way because we don't want downtime. Next up, we're building our second lumber camp. We already have our scout in place. We want to place this one within the first few seconds so it will tick along with the first lumber camp. Again, I'm choosing an inferior position for it to put us at 36 wood income. The next place we'll need our scout is for the first stone mine, so I'm sending him to that stone vein. We will not have enough gold for our first mine next turn, so we will not be building anything next cycle. Note that when a melee unit gets heavily injured, you can just tell them to move back most of the screen away and then shift command them to attack back to the fighting and they will arrive back with full health. Also note that I have the scout and the army in different control groups. It's very important to efficiently manage your troops so that you can clear as fast as possible. I'm even going to add the Lumber Camp to Control Group 3 here because we're going to need to shuffle some workers around later. It's looking like we've got a very open starting location here, which is actually very good for our economy. You'll soon see just how good. This is all going to become delicious farmland. You're also about to see that we have located those four stone tiles that we needed before we even started our first mine, which is great. That's not always going to be the case. Many times you'll only find it just in time to secure it before you need to build your second mine on it, which is why it's important to prioritize finding and securing that stone right after you finish with the wood spots. Speaking of which, it's time to build that first mine. 
Since nighttime's coming up and the army is very far away from this position, I'm just going to leave our scouting unit here to defend the mine just in case. Next cycle is going to be another idle building turn while we wait for enough funds for that second mine. Back with the army, we are going to clear the area around this stone vein so that when nighttime comes, we don't have any wanderers stumbling in there so we don't need to protect it. Also, now that we have secured both our wood and stone, all that's left is to create a buffer zone around all of our buildings and clear out in each direction to a good choke point. Ideally, the chokes will be small enough that a single wall piece can attract any incoming nightmares. During nighttime, it's never a bad idea to use your map hotkey to bring up the map every five seconds or so just to check that there's no random raid coming in on your base. It's almost time for mine number two, so we're going to send an archer back to spot for that. Now you'll see that I borrow a worker from the lumber yard in order to build this mine. That is because pre-watchtower update, you needed to have an available worker in order to place a production building. That is no longer true, so you don't technically have to steal a worker at this point yet, but it's also not going to do any harm if you do. No need to worry, we will get it fully staffed when the time is right. And specifically, that time is going to be right after the next tick of our wood income, which will bring us up to 50 wood, which is enough to make the keep, when we will take the workers out of one lumber camp and put them into this mine so that we can get 20 stone income for the keep. This worker transfer is the most finicky part of the build. I don't like it. I tried to get rid of it, but you just can't get the keep this fast without doing it. At least for the order faction, the others are a little better. It's almost nighttime, um, so I'm going to split a couple of units off to guard the entrances. Arguably, we should have cleared a little further out on this choke point, but we haven't cleared hardly anything on the north side, so I want to get up there, make sure we don't get blindsided. And then we're just going to micro the units until we get that 50 wood, and then we can transfer the workers. We will want that transfer to be done as quickly as possible, because the stone will be ticking over just after the wood does, and we need it to happen before that. And this is why it's not a bad idea to delay your first mine just slightly, like a few seconds or 20% of the gold income cycle, to make this timing easier. By design, you will notice that the gold, wood, and stone needed for the keep will all roll in right about the same time. So we've got the lumber camp selected, the wood ticks over, we take the workers out of the lumber camp, put them in the stone mine, stone ticks over, and then we do the keep. To do this any faster would require getting the two stone mines up sooner, and I don't believe that's possible, so I think this is the fastest keep possible, which pretty much makes it the best possible build up to this point. Possible. Now that the keep's going, we're going to have an idle turn while we wait on wood to come in, in the meantime, we're going to free up some workers by taking six off of the stone mines and refilling our lumber camps, leaving two left over for the huts that we're going to be building next. We are going to need those huts because we are going to need more population because we are going for a fast workshop. Why are we rushing the workshop? Because we want lodges. Gold is still the limiting factor for our progress, and lodges are far more efficient than houses. They get about 50% more gold per food, and they pay off in half the time. They're a very big improvement, so we gon' get it. So we'll start with a house, and then we're out of food, so we will follow up with two huts. For the purposes of this build, I'm going to assume that your huts are going to get around 10 food each, at least the early ones. We're going to keep exploring out to choke points. We found another good stone vein that'll be good for a third mine, which we'll want if we're going for ballista defense. More on that deviation later. We don't quite have enough workers yet, and if we keep borrowing from the mines, we're going to miss out on the next stone cycle. So we're going to go with three houses next, but we have to wait for the huts to hatch. I just put my houses wherever there's not farmland. I don't fuss around with the treasury. It's unfortunately just not a very good building, as it doesn't really give back enough to make up for the early farmland that you have to sacrifice. We're going to get one more house and then refill our stone mines now that we have plenty of workers. We did lose out on a little bit of stone from borrowing, but that's going to be totally fine. We've hit a point of interest out here. You really don't want to dig into those as they have a high density of enemies that you don't want to deal with in the very early game. But in this case, it's fine because there was a choke point right before that, so we just need to clear out that choke point a little bit. When dealing with dangerous packs, you usually want to pull some out, retreat a bit to where you can fight without pulling more of them, and then target down the Axemen because that is where all the damage comes from. And it's finally time for that long-awaited workshop. Just plop that down in a nice safe spot. 
At this point, lumber is soon going to eclipse gold as the limiting factor, so next up we are going to place our third lumber camp. In preparation for that, we are bringing down this archer to the best spot available. Who doesn't love autosave lag? Fun fact for the nerds, you want to get wood camps placed within the first 20% of the wood cycle in order to get it done in time to contribute to that cycle. So there's a sweet drinking age camp right there. Hopefully that doesn't affect production. From here we're going to be setting the stage for a mass house upgrade, so we're going to get a house and two huts. So we will bring our scout down to spot for those huts. After that, the workshop will finish and we'll grab the lodge research, and from there, we'll be setting up for a lodge explosion. But no, not like a southern large, like a lodge, like a cabin. Oh, stop it, you know what I mean. So here comes the tick. We'll get that house and two huts up and move our scout on over to the next hut spot. No, not hot spot, hut, stop, stop. I'm trying to do a tutorial here. We've only got a couple more directions to clear in here, and we've got a lot of space to work with, which is great. And now we're basically just going to twiddle our thumbs until that workshop finishes. Probably the hardest thing about following these builds is just to be paying attention to when the next cycle is coming and knowing what you're doing next, and not getting sucked into the micro of the unit. If you need to hit escape to see what's coming up next after you plant your buildings each time, that's totally fine. You can't do stuff in the game while paused in nightmare mode, but you can check your build order out of the game. So we finally got the lodge research. Next up is going to be four huts because we're going to need a lot of food to upgrade all these houses to lodges. And we're going to need to place those four huts before the wood ticks over so that we don't waste any wood. So you might want to bring over a second spotter. And nailed it. Now that we've used up what would have been waste wood on those four huts, we've got plenty of food, so it's time for three more houses. Looks like what I thought was a path was actually a little alcove, and what a lovely place it would be to live. How about we put a housing development here? People love to see nature out their window, and rocks are natural. I think they'll be very pleased. Now we're all set up for next cycle when our lodge research will pop, and we will pour all of our resources into upgrading our domiciles to Domicile Plus. All right, so the gold's going to tick over. We are going to upgrade all of the houses that we can. Then the wood will tick over and we'll upgrade some more. If you're wondering why we haven't researched farms, fun fact, huts are far more efficient at producing gold income due to their far lower upkeep cost. Trust me, they'll say that they need running water and insulated walls, but they don't. Fun fact about upgrading the lodges, you need to do it within the first 60% of the gold cycle in order for it to finish before the end of the next cycle. Yes, I am that anal retentive, fortunately for you. So when those finish, we're going to have a huge income boost to gold, and the limiting factor will once again shift to wood. So we're going to do another lumber camp. Let's get someone in place to act as a nightlight for our frightened construction workers. And we have finally come to a fork in the road. If you want to defend wave one with units, this is where you jump off the bandwagon and pretty much just do houses and huts along with a couple of barracks. But if you want to do ballista, then we need to get some storehouses up and a third mine. We'll do ballista first, so we need to get a spotter over to one of our stone veins. I can hear you shouting at your screen now, you idiot, why are you positioning to build a warehouse where you don't have a mine? Well, my protege, there's of course a very good reason for this. It's because past me was stupid. Very embarrassing, a blot on the great me family line. But no, it's not that bad because we're about to build another stone mine up there, and it'll also cover that lumber camp. Highly unfortunate that this choke point has an elite cell tower right in front of it with everybody looking for free Wi-Fi. So we can't place our defenses in the choke point lest whatever isekai hero comes out of that totem pole totally wreck it. So we'll have to build a little bit further back. Unfortunate, but the map has been pretty generous to us otherwise, so I can't complain too much. Anyway, we've got our nightlight over here so we can get our lumber camp, hut, and lodge down, which should give us enough wood income for rapid expansion. Next up is a stone mine, so we'll need someone in place for that. Here comes Kagome. Now, of course, normally you'd want to go with the big fatty pile of stone over there for your third mine, but just like with the wood camps at the start, I'm going to go with the smaller one just to show you that excellent map RNG is not necessary for this build. It has been engineered such that it should almost always work. I should also mention you don't have to hit the timings perfectly on all of the houses that you build. I made this assuming that a few of those would be missed. 
And that is the end of the nitpicking part of the build. From here on out, it's pretty much just plopping down huts and lodges as you can. There's only two more specific things you need. You need a second warehouse anytime within the next four turns in order to avoid wasting stone. We should get at least one wall piece down at every outer choke point along with a guard, because you never know when you're going to get a random raid. Oh, and then the second thing that we need, which I almost always forget, as I just did now, is ballista research. Kind of important if you're going for ballista defense. Yeah, make sure you get that before you need it. You'd be amazed how often I begin that research as the wave spawns. Usually you can make it work, but it's not ideal. Probably just as soon as you see that you have over 700 gold at some point, go ahead and do it. And double check at like one minute out from the wave that you have it. Now ideally I'd like to get a third storehouse because it's hard to have enough wood to get all the defenses down at once. But in order to do that, you'll probably need to get a fourth stone mine because obviously storehouses take stone. And the build as it is with just two storehouses leaves you with pretty much just enough stone for five ballista towers. Now you can of course get by with four, that is enough, but it gets a little hairy. Also, note that pretty much any map should have enough space for you to follow the build, but after the house upgrades, it'll be very dependent on the map as to how much income you can end up with before wave one smacks you in the face. Some maps are just way more cramped and crowded than others. If you find that you can't clear fast enough to keep expanding and your money's piling up, then go ahead and throw down a barracks, start producing units, and maybe even go for researching farms and that sort of thing. This one is quite open. We've cleared out a lot of space, so let's see how we do. And there you have it, 700 gold income pre-wave one. Not too shabby. You could get it a little higher, except about one minute out from the wave, you really want to start saving for your defenses, at least if you're doing a ballista defense. Now, it's never safe to assume you know which way the wave is going to go, so just make sure that you have vision of each spot you might need to defend. Plopping down a unit tower there is a good way to do that. You can throw down some delaying walls if you think you're pretty certain, but wait until it actually spawns before you do anything like placing ballista towers. There is enough time. Once the wave spawns and you see the path in the fog, then go ahead and throw down four or five ballista towers along with two to three layers of wall. Optionally leave a path for your hero to get to the front line and you're good to go. If you're wondering why I'm building so awkwardly in this video, it's because for some reason past me, who again is an idiot, did not want to delete this hut and house, even though they were very clearly in the way of the defenses. Don't be like past me. Make whatever space you need. I can't believe I'm related to that guy. In this case, the wave had a pretty short path to us, so we had to delay them a bit while our ballistas got ready. But as you'll see, it turns out fine. Now you want to keep spending your resources during the wave as well, so plop down that barracks, start pumping out units, do your research on the farm, the fire sconce. Honestly, you're going to have so much income that spending your money is going to be the hard thing, even all the way up to wave two. If you're about to lose any ballistas, go ahead and sell those just before they would die. A few things that I did not do in this video that you might want to do is uh, secure an iron mine, get a fourth stone mine, and get an earlier barracks. I would say these things are all more important than the small amount of gold income you would sacrifice to do them. Because again, we've got more gold than we know what to do with, really. And that concludes the order ballista build. Now let's hop in the time machine back to just after the house upgrades and see what would have been different if we wanted to defend with units instead. So, funny, funny story. I thought I had recorded both builds on this same map so that we could just jump back and see it exactly as it is, except with the unit build, and I didn't do that. That, that didn't happen. So, um, unfortunately, that save file is no longer available because that was on the previous patch before the uh, Watchtower update basically turned the game temporarily into a bug-ridden wasteland. So instead, we will take a look at how the unit defense fares on Wave 1 on this other map. We didn't go as hard in the paint on the eco on this map, so don't try and compare those. Generally, I find that the unit build comes to Wave 1 with, on average, around 100 less income than the Ballista build does. 
but of course you also are getting a jump start on your army so you're going to have about 30 troops which means you can start clearing the map much faster coming out of wave one than you can with the ballista defense so it's just a trade-off and i find them both equally viable now we will have that direct comparison that i wanted for the rebel and volatist builds which we will jump into momentarily but to put it simply the ballista and unit builds are exactly the same all the way up through the house upgrades from there the difference is instead of building two warehouses and a third mine you're going to immediately get an extra lumber camp spend your stone on unit upgrades instead of the warehouses and and get a barracks up at the start of night two. So the unit build is a bit more simple, but they're very similar. And again, we will get to see all of that in action in the following Rebel Volatist builds. I just wanted to throw this one in there to show you that the unit composition does work just as well as the Ballista Towers against a Nightmare Wave 1, because the Volatist and Rebel builds that I'm going to show you after this are in the Watchtower build and the custom settings are screwed up in the Watchtower update, so it's giving horrific waves instead of nightmare. So this clip is just to show you that what you get out of the build does work against a legitimate nightmare wave one. Oh, and the unit composition you choose doesn't matter much. You can go pretty much all soldier, you can go all archer, you can go anywhere in between. Uh, pikemen also can work, but I wouldn't do that because they're not as good for map clearing. But yeah, whatever you're feeling. If you go for archers, just put more walls up. And if you're going for heavy soldier, just make sure that you have at least two unit towers filled with archers set to target strongest so that they take out the axemen and the lobbers. All right, so the build for Rebels and Volatists is the same and is very similar to the order at the start. To help you compare, I have color-coded the list for you here. So the purple is what they have in common. The red is where the Rebel Volatist build differs from the order. So all you have to remember switching between the two up until the keep is to put a second house after the second lumber camp with this build order. Although do note that you should not use Aeolus Guard ability until after you do the keep lest you risk coming up a little bit short on the gold. Even though she gives birth to them on the spot, they still don't work for free. And happily, you do not have to do any worker transfers before the keep with this one. And that difference of course stems from the starting order troops having four to five more upkeep than the rebel and volatist starting soldiers. So the R and V gang have a little bit more population and income to get rolling faster. So just like before, we do immediate house, split off a scout, set everybody to target strongest, clear out the forest, get our scout to the lumber spot, follow up with a lumber camp, start looking for stone veins. We already found a nice five tile here. House after the lumber camp, scout to the second lumber spot, then the second lumber camp, then the first divergence point, a house after the second lumber camp. And from there, it's again the same. Stone mine, wait, Search each direction up to a stone vein until you find two spots totaling 10 plus tiles. Leave a spotter for stone mine two. Stone mine two. Notice that we have access to the guard now, but we're not going to use it yet. Alice is a proud, strong, independent woman, and she don't need no man. Wait and post guards at exposed buildings. Keep clearing out to good chokes and a little past them so you don't have wanderers wrecking your junk. No worker transfers needed. And finally, the keep upgrade. Now from here, things will be pretty different. We'll start with our first and only borrowing of workers, two from the mine. That is so that we'll be able to build our first two huts, which again are expected to get around 10 food. And those huts are so that we can get two houses so we'll have enough workers for our workshop. You'll notice some differences in the ground terrain. That's because this is on the Watchtower update that introduced different terrain types. Pre-Wave 1, you should mostly just keep your putter on the green and avoid the deadlands, as that's where lots of spitters and wraiths like to hang out. Time for those two houses, now that the huts have finished. And since those go down near the end of the cycle, we need to be ready to quickly put down the workshop. So we'll get our scout in position, and it looks like we got a nice spot against the wall here, right next to an eventual warehouse. Don't forget to leave space for those. On the same turn as the workshop, you're going to put those two workers who were hoping for a better life back into the mines because our stone is about to take over. And from here, we will not fuss with them any further. 
The god of gaming has turned the lights back on, and that means it's time for our lumber camp. So we'll mosey a unit on over there and plop that down within the first 20% of the wood cycle. FYI, you might want to set your guard to target strongest, and also put him on a control group so you can tell him manually to target axemen, wraith, and spitters when you see them so that they take the heat. Next up is two huts preparing for that house upgrade. Keep clearing this out so we can secure it for farmland. Then lodge research, followed by a house as soon as those huts finish. We hit a point of interest on the left and a workable choke, so we'll move on to the bottom side. Securing that iron will give us a great head start. Next is three huts, again building up food for that house upgrade. Make sure to get them down before the wood ticks over. Point of interest down here too, unfortunately, but we're going to need to clear further if we want to secure this iron mine. Research is almost finished, so it's time to gentrify. Goodbye freedom, hello homeowners association. So once again, this is where the unit and ballista defense builds diverge. We'll do ballista first and then come back and show units. For real this time. So house upgrades are followed by our first warehouse, just as with the order build. Ideally, you'd like to place it next to a mine and a lumber camp. We're going to leave one unit behind to defend this area and send the army out to start clearing the right side. Next up is just a lovely little cabin in the woods because we are saving up for big plays on the next turn. No, it's not a car, unfortunately. It will be our third stone mine and another lumber camp. So we'll send our spotter over to the next best stone vein and plop that down as soon as possible because it needs to be within the first 30% of the stone cycle. And immediately follow it up with that lumber camp because that similarly needs to be within the first 20% of the wood cycle. No real reason that I chose to clear to the right side instead of the left. They both had equally good choke points. And again, that's the end of the structured part of the build. From here, you just need to get your second warehouse up within nine turns. And of course, ballista research. I'm going to toss down three huts because otherwise we're going to lose some wood, and you should never let good wood go to waste, you know? You know? Ready. And we'll get our second warehouse right quick this time, since some people just can't be trusted. From there, it's just going to be the same old struggle to find farmland and spend our resources fast enough, while ever expanding our territory to create more work for ourselves. There's a lesson in there somewhere. We're going to go ahead and grab this iron mine right quick because that is going to be the next limiting resource on our progress. You need it for the next keep upgrade, the tier 3 unit upgrade, which is very important for taking down crushers, and you need it for siege, and of course those last two are vitally important for wave defense, and thus winning the game. We're also going to go ahead and grab a barracks nice and early because it's nice to have a few units to spread around the base for defense and it'll help us spend excess resources during the wave on getting started on our army. One of the nice things you can afford to do if you don't miss an entire cycle of stone because you built your storehouse too late, like an idiot who can't even follow his own build. Now the wave is coming from the north, so I just kind of assume it's going to come from either the left or right side since the top is blocked. We'll see how that works out. So we're going to need vision wherever it comes in so that we can see to place our walls and our ballista once we know the path for sure after the wave spawns. So I'm going to go ahead and build a unit tower at each of those spots and then we'll wait until the wave spawns before finishing the defenses. Normally, I recommend that you stop building at least a minute and a half out from the wave to make sure that you have enough resources to put your ballistas down. In this case, they were going to have to take a longer path than normal, so I spoiled myself, went to the mall, bought a few huts, you know how it is. The cherry has popped, let's see which side they're going to. Ah, the bottom side. Yes, of course. This has been happening a lot on the new Watchtower update maps. Now, in this case, I actually should have suspected that it was going to go to the bottom because if you look at the other options, the left and right are both very narrow choke points, and the wave path will always try to take the widest path possible to your keep. 
That doesn't always help you because you might have a wide choke point near your keep, but further out in the map where you can't yet see, there's a narrow choke point along that pathway so they won't take it. But in this case, the chokes on the left and right side of our keep are about as small as they get, so it's unlikely there was a choke point more narrow than that on the bottom route. But them going that far around means that we have plenty of time to set up. As long as you don't start building before they spawn, you'll be okay. So as you see, we have saved up 2,500 gold, 175 wood, and 175 stone. That will be plenty. We'll throw down a couple layers of walls and then fill in behind with preferably five ballista. It's not necessary, but you can also leave an avenue for your hero to get out there and soak up a ton of experience. That done, we'll just make sure that all of our entrances to the base are covered with at least one wall piece and one unit. And we should be good to go. We'll put the hero on hold position, blocking their little road there, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Just make sure you keep spending your resources on units and research, and sell any ballista towers before they go down. Oh, and maybe don't get your hero down to like one hit point. Pro tip. All hail the chipmunk queen. Oh yeah, about that little corridor for the hero. Apparently the game thinks that this is locked in. Back me up here, guys. You see the pathway there, right? It's big enough to accommodate a baby crusher crying out loud. No, apparently not. Apparently that tree at the back and the ballista are forming an impenetrable wall that Alys in all her decadence cannot squeeze through. Maybe because she won't go anywhere without a hunky guard on each arm. Maybe because all that wine has begun to metastasize size in her belly region. I don't know, but I'm calling shenanigans. All right, hop on the magic school bus and let's travel back in time to just before the house upgrades and see how things would have changed if we had gone for the unit build. Modern technology, am I right? There's a quick refresher on what the build order looks like if you need it. Get yourself all reoriented, especially if you were never properly oriented in the first place. But if you've been through college or corporate employment, you've probably got enough orientation for a lifetime. What were we talking about? Oh, right, the point. Yeah, so we're doing those blue bits down there. So here we are doing the house upgrades, and instead of a warehouse, we're going to follow that up this time with a lumber camp and a unit upgrade since we don't need to spend the stone on the warehouse. That lodge there is because after the lumber camp goes down, we're in free-for-all. It's just lodges and huts and mojitos and butts as far as the eye can see. But it wouldn't be me if I didn't forget something, so this time I forgot to do the unit upgrade. How long do you think it'll take me to remember? Place your bets now. All right, so it's not entirely free for all. We do still need to get our barracks down. The timing of when you do that is fluid, but I usually do it around the start of night two. If you're going to stick with just one barracks, do it a little bit earlier. If you're going to do two barracks, you can delay it a little longer. Time to check the tickets on those unit upgrade bets. Who had ridiculously long freaking time? You're a winner! See the clerk at the front desk for your handshake. We'll go ahead and claim that iron mine again, and we're putting a little bit of extra defense on it with that unit tower since it's right on the edge of the Deadlands and next to that point of interest. In general, I was a little bit more cautious this run, so that did reduce our income a little bit, but not by too much. On the other hand, I don't know how much I capitalized on it, but we did clear out that right side much more quickly than with the ballista build. So you'll notice that the Wave 1 crystal is on the right side this time. Fun fact, if you didn't know, which crystal goes first is not chosen at the start of the map. They might cut the head off the chicken right at the start, but it lands in a different spot each time. Different chickens for each seed, I assume. So we've already got unit towers at the two entrances that I would assume it might come from if this were my first time playing the map. I think we know better. You can see it about two minutes out here. I'm maxed on all my resources. I'm not able to spend it fast enough, so I'm throwing down a second barrack so that we can pump out more troops. I should also be getting more unit upgrades because as you'll notice, we keep maxing out on stone and so I'm wasting a lot here. But if we wait for a perfect execution from me, we're gonna be waiting forever. So consider this a realistic rendition of the build where you make a few mistakes. Oh, and the last piece of the unit build is to research the fire scones because you're gonna have soldiers on the front line. They might get hit by the spitter and get horrified. You also might get the malice where enemies explode with horror, so it's a really good idea to be able to clear that. And you're going to want to have fire sconces available after wave one anyway. 
And Pop goes the weasel. Where are they going to go? Holy darkness and hellfire all the way around the map, 270 degrees. Who could have guessed? For those of you wondering, yes, that does mean that every single crystal feeds into this exact path. It's like my own custom game mode, and I lovingly term it the nightmare toilet. And yes, I did record it, and hopefully we'll have it uploaded soon. Check the end of the video to see if it's ready. Fun factoid, manning a unit tower gives it almost as much vision range as a fire sconce. I actually just learned that, so I don't know if that's something new with the update or if it's always been that way and I'm just that oblivious. Probably the second one. Impressively, despite having cleared out the right side faster than with the ballista build, I've somehow managed to do less with it. Oh yes, I'm that good. Clearly been slacking on the building placement. We have been flush on resources that should have been filled with huts, and we haven't even turned all the food that we already have into houses. Yeah, now that mistakes are being made, it's not me, but we. So yeah, we briefly broke above 600, but we ended up at plus 590 right before the wave got here. But we definitely should have been a little further ahead on income. Now it is true that you end up spending more money on units in the unit build than you do on storehouses with the ballista build, but then the ballista research itself is 700 gold versus the fire sconce research is only 300 gold, so there's a lot to balance out in there, but I think ultimately it's the upkeep of the units mostly that reduces the amount of income that you can get with the unit build, both because they reduce it directly and because they reduce how many houses you can get up pre-wave 1. For reference, if you get about 30 units by the time the wave spawns, which is what I usually do, and they're about half soldier, half archer, that's 75 upkeep. But again, the difference is not going to be as vast as it is in this example because I wasted at least 500 gold just from storage overflowing. That would have been enough for another couple of huts and lodges right there. I was way too slow putting my buildings down, so I spent some money on researching farms even though we didn't need it yet. So that's another couple lodges. And as you can see, we have a lot of excess food that didn't go into housing yet, so we could have gotten one or two more out of that. So put it all together and that's nearly a hundred income right there that could have been added into this unit build but did not because I'm a massive scrub. So yeah, don't take this as a valid comparison of the outcomes of the builds. The unit build should really only be like around 80 to 100 less income than the ballista build. And for getting that head start on map clearing, I'd say that's a reasonable trade-off. Anyway, I hope this helped my fellow nerd brethren in jump-starting your early economies, because you would not believe how long it took to edit. For the sake of my sanity, find this useful so that I can justify the time spent. If I decide to make a similar guide for the hero list and fog every night modifiers that even fewer people will watch, you should see that and all other related videos popping up now. Did you find this helpful? Did I screw up even more than I realized? Are you a unit or a ballista man? Have you found an even better build? Let us know in the comments below. We want to hear from you. No, 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 not you. No, Scoot aside. Yeah, yeah, you in the back there. You. And if you want more delicious empirical testing and tips for Age of Darkness, can't hurt to subscribe. And in the immortal words of Bugs Bunny, that's all, folks.